On the 10th of March, 1914, five months before the outbreak of the First World War, a young woman called Mary Richardson entered the National Gallery in London. In her youth, she'd been an art student. She'd been to the National many times before, but on this occasion, she wasn't here to admire the wonderful paintings. Quite the opposite. She was here to commit an act of terrible vandalism. She walked up to a painting by the Spanish master Velasquez, the so-called Rokeby Venus. She stood for a moment, apparently lost in thought. And then from under her coat, she pulled a meat cleaver, a kind of small ax. She broke the protective glass. And before the guards had time to pull her back, she'd slashed the figure of Venus seven times across the back. It was the worst act of criminal damage in the history of the National Gallery. And of course, it begged the question, why? Why do such a terrible thing? And she gave her answer, unprompted, to the policeman that led her away. She said, quite simply, I'm a suffragette. Now, you can't have failed to notice how so far this story I've been telling has been somewhat incomplete. I set out to tell the story of how we won the vote. Instead, I've told the story of how men won the vote, with the help of women, granted. Women had marched on the field of Peterloo. They'd swelled the ranks of the Chartists. They'd showed their mettle in the great labor disputes of the 1880s. But by the turn of the 20th century, the struggle for votes for women had barely begun. Women in Victorian Britain were held back because society back then pigeonholed men and women almost as different creatures. Men were seen as the rational sex, at home in the world of politics and public life. Women were seen as less rational, more emotional, better suited to the joys of domesticity. Once married, they could look forward to years of fruitful homeliness. And these women, the argument went, well, they didn't need the vote. Their husbands, ruling class, middle class, working class, they all had the vote. Surely one vote per household was enough. Let the husband vote on behalf of his wife. That was the logic that kept women out of the democratic process. The idea that their husbands would vote for them. It was patronizing, it was profoundly undemocratic. More than that, the argument just didn't hold water, as was proved in 1901 when a delegation of mostly unmarried women textile workers presented a petition to Parliament calling for the vote for unmarried women on the logic that they didn't have husbands to vote for them. Well, the petition was just laughed out of Parliament. Lots of chauvinistic comments were made about pretty young things bothering their heads with subjects they couldn't possibly understand. Bottom line, Parliament just didn't want to give the vote to women, and it would take a decade of struggle for them even to take the issue seriously. The campaign for women's suffrage, like Chartism, began peacefully. The suffragists, as they were known, believed the force of their arguments would win the day. But six years of petitions, of speeches, won them nothing but a few false promises and the backing of a handful of male MPs. And so, just as Chartism had turned from moral force to physical force, so in 1903, a splinter organization emerged in the women's suffrage movement, dedicated to deeds, not words. This was the group to which Mary Richardson belonged, the so-called suffragettes. Wherever you go in central London, you find yourself in places associated with the suffragettes. They staged mass rallies in Trafalgar Square. They heckled MPs in the visitors gallery of the House of Commons. They chained themselves to the railings outside Buckingham Palace. They smashed windows in Downing Street. And time and time again, they welcomed arrest as a means to publicize their cause. The Prime Minister at the time was a man called Herbert Asquith, a passionate opponent of votes for women. 
And from about 1908, this became an almost personal struggle between Asquith and the suffragettes. When suffragettes in Holloway Prison went on hunger strike, demanding the right to be treated as political prisoners, Asquith authorized the use of forced feeding. And when this proved too much for the public to contemplate, he passed the infamous Cat and Mouse Act, in which hunger strikers on the point of death were released, only to be immediately re-arrested once they'd regained their strength. One such prisoner on temporary release was Mary Richardson, a veteran of more hunger strikes than any other suffragette just out of Holloway Prison on that day that she slashed the Velasco. Were their tactics justified? It's a matter of opinion. Were their tactics effective? No. The problem was, the suffragettes seemed so extreme, so shocking, so unladylike, they put off people that otherwise might have supported their cause. Get this, in the first seven months of 1914, the police recorded over 140 acts of destruction. Not just paintings slashed, but buildings torched, even a bomb set off in Westminster Abbey. Hardly surprising, the public recoiled. But then, in August 1914, all this drama was pushed aside by events on the European stage. August 1914 saw the outbreak of the First World War, an epic, brutal conflict that was to cost over a million British lives. Winning this war required unity on the home front, men and women pulling together. Suffragists and suffragettes alike rallied to the flag, the cause of votes for women for the moment put aside. But ironically, these years of war advanced the cause of votes for women as never before. This is what's left of the Naval Armaments Factory at Gosport, one of numerous places across the country where munitions, shells and cartridges were produced throughout the First World War. The trouble was, the more the war dragged on, the more the men who worked here were needed at the front, fighting in the trenches. So who stepped up to fill the breach? Women in their thousands. They worked here filling shells with explosives, preparing fuses, repairing gun barrels. And all across the country, they were joined by hundreds of thousands more, not just working class women for whom work was nothing new, but women of all social classes, helping the war effort as colliers, as porters, as drivers, as laborers in the fields and in the factories. By 1918, women had proved they weren't the weaker sex. Alongside men, they helped win the war, and they overturned society's views of the role of men and women. And so, bowing to the inevitable, in February 1918, Parliament passed the Representation of the People Act, granting all women over 30 the vote and paving the way within a decade for the complete enfranchisement of all adult men and women. Votes for all, the right for which we had struggled for so long. <laughs>